good party. Well, good evening, folks. Oh, we're going to have a good time tonight. When we all get to heaven, let's, let's join in singing that, if you would. I think the words will be up on the screen, and uh, if not, it's hymn number 603. Ready?
church one time, they said if you've been here more than one time, uh, second time there, you're already home folks, so you're not even a, a visitor. <laughs> All right, let's, let's sing hymn number 561. It says, why do I sing about Jesus? steps of Jesus.
I'm going to take up an offering. And uh, I'd say welcome to everyone here tonight. Beautiful day today. It looks cool, but it's a beautiful day. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for a beautiful day that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to gather together in your house to sing praises to you and to worship you. Father, we ask that you take this offering, bless it, multiply it, may be used to further your kingdom, and to reach others and to tell others about Jesus. Pray for Pastor as he leads the song tonight, Lord, and present the message that you laid upon his heart. Forgive us of our sins. Daddy, thank you so much. People need the Lord. Always a wonderful hymn. Speaking of hymns, I uh, was talking to Gene over here before the service, and he was telling me he wanted to sing the good old hymns. That's what he liked. Anybody here else like the good old hymns? That's what Gene likes singing. That, and I told him, I said, this hymnal here is a dangerous hymnal because in 2008 it got me in trouble in a deacon's meeting. This exact hymnal in my hand that is in your pew. This hymnal came out in January of 2008, and I was in Georgia, and I, I follow everything that comes out by Lifeway and what our Baptists put out, and I was aware we had the old hymnal back at our church back then, and this hymnal here has a lot of the, when I say newer songs, I mean that's like 20 years old, they're not like came out a year ago, though, so they were even a little dated even in 2008 when they came out. So I asked for a preview copy of the hymnal, Baptist is a free one to look at, because you know we had about a few hundred of them for our church. It probably cost a few thousand dollars. And I looked at it and called, this would be great. Our hymnals we had in our church at that time were getting a little dated and a little worn out, and we needed some new hymnals. So I go in the deacons meeting, and I, you live and learn. I'd only been a pastor about three years at that point. And I go in a deacons meeting, and I said, men, we need to purchase this hymnal. This hymnal has a lot of new praise songs in it, and it's brand new. It just came out. By this point, it's probably about two months old. It just came out a couple of months ago. It will go a great way to introduce some new songs and make some positive changes to our church. Uh, I think it would be great. And so I wanted us to start moving forward with that. Now, this was in the deacons meeting. There was a gentleman named Buddy. He, and he was in his 70s, and Buddy didn't like to change. I quickly, I had to, I quickly learned how to present things. He said, Preacher, you need to quit changing stuff around here. We don't need any of these new songs to be sung. We need to keep the hymnal we have. We don't need the new hymnal. And it was, and he didn't say it that nice. It was very firm. I tell you, uh, Rob, you mind turning me? If I raise my voice, it might get a little, it looks a little loud. I can, uh, so if you turn me down just a little bit. And I learned, now eventually, we did buy that hymnal. I had taken me, took me about three or four years to get through it, but I had to plant those seeds and go a different route. But eventually we got there. But I quickly learned, just a lot of folks don't like new songs. And even what's amazing about that, Gene, the songs in here, even though they're so-called new, they're still like 20, 30 years old. But that was new, so well, with that. I see someone out here I need to give an update on. Miss Wanda Woolums is here. Wanda, I want to share about Wanda. I spoke to Wanda on the phone. Was it Thursday, Wanda, we spoke, or Friday? Listen, we talked on the phone either Thursday or Friday evening, and Wanda has received some bad news this week. And Wednesday night, we're going to have a special time of prayer for her. 
Wanda was up here at our church. We are part of the Pasadena Neighborhood Association. We're a faithful member our church here, because this neighborhood right over yonder is the Pasadena Neighborhood Association, and we're good neighbors with them. I know the director, and a lot, a lot of you, some of you live in our, and are members of that Neighborhood Association, and Miss Wanda was, uh, goes to our meetings. They meet here, I believe it's once a quarter. They meet on like a Tuesday night, 6.30, and they had their meeting down here on Tuesday night, and Wanda choked on a chicken, a piece of chi- a, a chicken, some type of chicken bone. But it ended up being a blessing, I want to tell you. She, did you go by ambulance, Wanda? Went home, then went to the hospital. Uh, she had a hard time. This happened in her fellowship hall. Goes up, was it Baptist Health? Did y'all, is that where y'all went? Baptist Health? Went to Baptist Health, and they, uh, the chicken bone was the least of her problems. Uh, but a bone with a cheek piece of so she choked on a piece of chicken breast. So you know not to eat bones. And they did some scans on her, and they have found possible esophagus cancer and possible liver cancer. And we're going to have a special time of prayer for Wanda on Wednesday night at our uh, Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday night Bible study. We're going to pray for you, Wanda. And she's going to have, I believe it's May 9th, is that right, when you're going to have additional tests run, and we want to pray this is not cancer. Uh, just a good news. May 9th. M- May 9th is when you're going to get the good news. That is correct. We will, we will be praying for that. So, uh, but but you, cho- uh, you choking on the chicken ended up being a blessing because the doctors were able to catch the possible spot on your esophagus as well as your liver with that. So, Juan, I'm glad you're here tonight, and we're, we're going we're gonna to have an intense time of prayer. At her, wait, that's Miss Wanda Woolham, longtime member of our church, and we want to be praying for her with this, this upcoming appointment. I want to give you all an update on our Sunday night schedule. Next Sunday night, you need to definitely be here. We have Buddy Lyles in concert. We've put the posters up around the church. Buddy Lyles is going to be here at 6 o'clock next Sunday, and it's a, a very unique uh, old timey, so Gene's really gonna like it. Southern Gospel Concert is right up your alley. Buddy's very, very well known, very talented. I went online, I was reading all about him. I think it's gonna be great. We hope our sanctuary is packed with folks coming for that concert. So that's gonna be next Sunday night, the 28th of April. And then on May 5th, Raphael Jubin will be preaching. May 12th, we have no Sunday night service that's the second sunday in in may because it's mother's day may 19th we will have sunday night church i'll be preaching and we have business meeting afterwards i tell you on may 19th i have either four or five people lined up to get baptized during the 11 15 service so it should be that should be a great time uh and I want to tell you, that'll be at the beginning service. For those who come at 845 service, what you want to do after Sunday school gets out, just come slip in the back and just watch the baptism and then just head out. You don't have to stay for round two the whole time, but you do need to come and attend the baptism that day. So that will be on May 19th. Very, very special day for that. Open up your Bibles tonight to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16. As you know, I'm preaching on Peter on Sunday mornings out of the book of uh, first Peter the epistle that he wrote but on Sunday nights here we are studying the life of Peter and we're looking here at uh, a couple things or three things that P- Peter did so tonight we're going to be in Matthew chapter 16 then we'll flip over in a little bit and look at Matthew chapter 26 we're going to be looking here at how Peter he confessed Christ and the Bible says that he received the keys of the kingdom so he received these keys and then not only that we're going to see about he believed that he would never fall away. We have to be very careful. We never want to make sure we say, oh, that will never happen to me. Oh, I would never do that. Oh, that, you know, that, that type of stuff I won't get involved in. You know, the devil is, uh, you, the Bible says he crouches at the door. It's what that, he, he's crouching. So that means when you walk through a door, he's just on the other side and you didn't see him there. He's waiting to attack you. He catches you off guard when you least expect it. And he did that with Peter. We're going to see that this evening. 
And then we're going to uh, look here about how Peter, after he denies Jesus, he realizes immediately what he has done, and he is weeping. Not just weeping because he feels sad, he's weeping bitterly. He has denied the Lord, and the Lord said it was going to happen. And, and I think what we, we see is how the Lord, and then when I pick back up on May 19th, preaching Sunday night, we're going to sh show how he was reinstated. Peter is nowhere to be found at Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection scene. In fact, the angels had to tell the women, go make sure you go find, go to Galilee and tell all the, uh, all the disciples and Peter, because Peter had gone back to his old life, and he had gone back to the Sea of Galilee, and he was fishing. Remember, he was from a little sea town there uh, as a fisherman, Bethsaida, which is right there on the Galilean Sea in that lake. So we're going to pick up in our Bibles here about Matthew chapter 16. Now, if you were a Roman Catholic, and I had two people in my family just return back from Italy, and if you go to Italy, you get to tour Roman Catholic churches. And our Roman Catholic, in fact, one of those long, young ladies who's going to be getting baptized uh, next month is going to is bat getting baptized out of Roman Catholicism. We don't ever want to be critical of our Roman Catholic friends, because that's not how you win people to the Lord, uh, by, by uh, putting down another faith. But you do have to show to people what these things mean. But our Roman Catholic friends, this passage we're going to read, this is where they claim they get their authority. This is where the Pope believes he comes from, the lineage of the Pope, the papacy. So what we're about to see here, I'm going to show you, I believe, what Jesus Jesus was not instituting the Roman Catholic Church or the papacy with this passage whatsoever. What he is saying here is he's saying, Peter, you're about to become the leader of all the disciples and all the apostles in the early church after I go up to heaven and the Holy Spirit comes. And what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, meaning the ministry that you do on earth will also be the same ministry will be approved in heaven, meaning what I have taught you here on earth, you are also could go do, and that is preaching the good news to people and directing people how to be saved. That's what he's trying to say. That's what it means to hold the keys of the kingdom. It's not to say only, only Roman Catholics are saved. Only people part of the, the, with the Vatican and what they teach in their catechism are believers. He's saying, Peter, you are the leader of this group, and you're going to be the one who's going to take it and start with these 12 disciples and just preach the good news, and it will grow. And what's amazing about this also is this passage also teaches us all about church growth. Everybody wants their church, including Broadway, to grow. We all want to experience growth. And the key to church growth is actually found in this passage here. Because it's actually going to tell us when we read this that God, Jesus, He grows the church. He's the one. So ultimately, when we are faithful as a Bible-believing church, when we're faithful in uh, studying our Bible, and preaching the Bible, and uh, having a prayer life, praying and being active in ministry, God blesses that church, will bless this church. And that is the ministry we want to participate in with that. So we're in our Bibles here, Matthew chapter 16. Here we go, verse 13. I want you to follow along. I believe it's up on the screen as well. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, that is in, this is one of the most northern regions Jesus went to. This is uh, 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. So this is, and I'm going to show you a picture of this region, what it looks like, because something very significant happens here. He asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. What's well, interesting, all those people were, all were important. John the Baptist, John the Baptist there, he had already been executed. He was beheaded, it, but he also baptized Jesus. He was Jesus' cousin. But people loved John the Baptist. Many of the early disciples, possibly Peter, we know for a fact Andrew, 
were actually disciples of John the Baptist before they were disciples of Jesus. And what happened was because he was beheaded, he, you know, when he was a martyr, he died for his a bold preaching against Herod. John the Baptist preached against sin, and that got him beheaded. He preached against uh, Herod's adulterous affairs he was having. And then it says here, Elijah. Well, who was Elijah? Elijah, he didn't die. He went up in the chariots to heaven. So people are saying, who is this man, Jesus? Could he be John the Baptist who was beheaded? Could he be Elijah? Elijah never died. He, and then it also says, he was Jeremiah. Jeremiah I find really interesting. Jeremiah had a hard ministry. He saw very little success. Now, Jesus saw a lot of great success, not necessarily in a, a thousands of converts. Jesus wasn't trying to get thousands and thousands of people because a lot of those people actually abandoned him. He was there pushing back against the devil healing people, driving out demons, and also teaching these 12 men that he's the Messiah, and they're going to continue on his work, and he's headed to the cross. That was his ministry there. But they equated him with Jeremiah because they knew Jeremiah had a hard time. It was a challenge. Uh, we know of zero converts of Jeremiah. Jeremiah struggled. And it goes on to say here, uh, so they throw out these names, and then Simon Peter answered, or, or I'm sorry, before I get verse 15, but you, he asked them, who do you say I am? So we had the general question. We first have to say, why is Jesus even asking this question? What's he trying to do here? Why does he want to know the news reports on what the word is on the street about who he is? And I believe what we're going to see here is he's, he knows Peter's going to answer, and he's going to make it very clear, it says, Peter, this confession you're about to make is actually the Christian confession, what it means to be a believer. And he says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Making it personal. Simon Peter spoke up and he answered. Remember, he's the spokesman. He's the leader of all the disciples. He answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That there was uh, the first key statement we see in the presence of all the other disciples. Now, we know that in Matthew 3, 17, uh, the disciples said something very similar. They confessed who Jesus was. They turned from their sins. But here, at this point, this statement he's making, this is a public confession. They're acknowledging Jesus, he's the Messiah, and he's the son of the living God. They're beginning to see this is, this is the one. He is the one we have been awaiting for. He's asking, who am I? And he's not just a prophet. He's not a good man. He's, he is the Messiah. He's the one the Old Testament has been, we've been awaiting. And then look what Jesus says. Verse 17, Jesus responded, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And this is what happens when someone gets saved. This is a, Jesus telling us exactly what happens when somebody gets saved. What Peter just said there, he's saying this is, what, this is the confession. And you confess Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He's your Savior. And then Jesus says, it was the Lord who opened up your eyes so you could see this. This was no accident. So in our life, what, has, what happens in our spiritual life is God opens up our eyes so we can see the Lord. And we respond like Peter does. This is what we call conviction of sin. People come to church, or that you witness to them, they're at work, and they hear the good news, and God opens up their eyes and they think, I need Christ. I need to be saved. And so it wasn't just some decision that Peter made, it was the Lord doing this for him. Verse 18, And I also say that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now that's a key word phrase there, on this, and on this rock I will build my church. This was said in the context of Caesarea Philippi. So I have a picture of the exact spot of what likely was going on 
in Caesarea Philippi. So that's the talk right there. So where this is at, this is in the, probably the most northern region that Jesus went to. This is a very large rock. And Jesus was probably pointing at the rock and said, Peter, and on this rock, the gates of Hades will not prevail. What's also, do you see that big hole right there? That is, that people consider that an eternal hole. It's really deep, and you fall into it, you'll never get out. And what happened is, how they call it eternal, is you could throw something in there, like a stone, and it just falls, and you don't hear where it lands, so you don't know what happened. There was false god worship going on at that entrance. That was the goddess of Pan. And what would happen back in Bible times is people would go who did not worship the Lord. They would go there and they would worship these false gods. And, and, P, and Jesus is saying, and that was considered that hole right there. That was considered, that's the gateway to hell, essentially, is what he's saying. He says, that's what, back in Bible times, and it was, this is very significant, this picture, because the people... And you, and you can't go up into a rock anymore. They have put like a gate there so people can't. And sadly, in, during that time, they would sacrifice babies. It, they would, babies were thrown in there. It was horrific, some of the stuff that was going on. Uh, that would go, and it's like three or 400 feet down. I mean, it's a massive drop. And it, um, Jesus is saying, the gates of Hades, that's the hell in that hole right there. It will not overpower it. You're going to be the rock, Peter. This is the foundation of who you are. And I believe, now we don't know this for a fact, I believe Jesus was pointing at this rock when he made this statement. He says, Peter, you and you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Meaning, below is hell, but you're going to have a church above that, and that's way beyond that. You don't have to worry about what's down there. That has been defeated. Christ is showing the picture of the, the Christian church that's starting with not as making Peter a pope or anything about a Roman Catholic church. He's saying, Peter, you're going to be there at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit comes and he's just going to, 3,000 people are going to get saved. You're going to be the one that stands up and you're going to make the exact same confession that you just made right here. That Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. That is Peter's message. Because the people are wondering, where is the Messiah at? And it's, it's the Lord Jesus. So this is very important. Keep going here. Verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will have be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What he's talking about there. Again, he is not creating a Roman Catholic church saying here are the keys. The keys to heaven is this confession. The confession he made is in verse 16. You are the Messiah, the Son of the loving God. He says, Peter, I'm going to start something with you. In the gospel, that's the keys. It's the good news. It's the message of Jesus is the salvation. So what happens, we live in a world today, here in 2024, where all people do is just dilute, dilute everything around us. This past week, I celebrated my 19th year, Gene, as being a pastor. 11 years and uh, 7 months in Georgia, 7 years and 4 months here. Anyway, 19 years it adds up to be. And do you know the biggest challenge today compared when back from, two th from April of 2005? You invite people to church, they are busy. They are busier than they were in 2005. I remember 2005, that first year. We could just have an impromptu pizza party, like on a Friday night. Now, it was a smaller setting. It might not have been as, as busy as Lexington. 
you could just have, hey, we're all going to go out to the pizza parlor after church. We're going to go to uh, yeah, Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut and just have this get together. If you do that today, you have to give people a one month notice. They're just, they do, do, they do. They're too busy. And it's challenging to plan stuff. And people literally, right now, just even Sunday night church, it's, there's a million and one other things going on. And I want to tell you that the danger of that, what you say, how, what is that, what do you do with that, Pastor? There's a lot of churches don't have Sunday nights anymore. A lot of churches don't even have Wednesday night. I was talking to somebody who is visiting our church this morning, and they actually told me they were looking at family, they have a teenager, for a youth group because their church doesn't have Wednesday night youth group. And like they just don't have it. They can't get the kids to come on Wednesday night. They only have Sunday morning only church. And they're just looking for a church that says, hey, we just want a midweek youth program. And I think what happens is the devil, what he does is that he says here, you're going to have the keys. So our message, when churches start cutting their events, cutting their services, cutting their programs, you, that's less time that the gospel is going to be preached. Less time, fewer prayers that are going to be prayed. Fewer people to be prayed for to overcome cancer. It's just less and less and less. That's our greatest challenge we deal with. The busyness of people. Even retired people are busy. Did y'all know that? You meet somebody who's retired, they're just busy. There's a lot of stuff going on. And there's always something to do. And the devil has blinded so many people on the busyness of what they have. And it goes on to say here, and this is what he told them. So understand that verse in verse 19. The keys to the kingdom of heaven. This here is one who is the con- receives the confession of what it means to be a believer. He's saying you have to get this right. People who confess Jesus is their Savior. And this gospel are the people who are saved. And in verse 20 he says, Then he gave disciples order, orders to tell no one that he was the Messiah. So after he reveals this to them, he says, oh, by the way, I don't want you to tell anybody because I'll get crucified. It's true, but you just, you just hold on to him. You're not quite ready yet for the whole world to know. So that's what Jesus is doing to Peter. And Peter here, he's being made the leader of the heaven, of, of, of the 12 disciples, and he is going to have the keys. And the keys are the confession. He, it's the, what Peter just said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that is salvation. That is how we are saved. And that's what Peter is going to lo- use. So when it says, whoever, whatever is bound in earth is, uh, whatever is bound in heaven is bound on earth, loose in heaven, that means what, what we have received from Jesus, what has happened in heaven, we are to proclaim here on earth. So the word of God, because this came from heaven, this came from the Lord, we should, pro- we should proclaim that. Okay, flip over in your Bible now to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. This here is about Peter and how he is never going to fall away. Peter was a bold man, and he's going to make a phenomenal a statement how he will, these other people might fall away, but not Peter. He's different, he believes. And it's dangerous for us, and I think the principle for us, for us to realize is that anything, if it can happen to Peter, somebody who just confess Jesus is the Messiah, someone who's just told by Jesus that he's going to be the rock, any of us can stumble. And I think the response of Peter is actually what we're going to see in three weeks. Peter, when he did fall, he actually, uh, he repented. He turned back to the Lord. And because, sadly, it's going to happen to us. We will sin against the Lord. It's how we respond to the Lord after we sin with that. So you're in your Bible now. You're in towards the end of the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, thir- verse 31. So they just had the Lord's Supper. And then look what, look what Jesus says here. So th- um, they had their Lord's Supper and they went out to the Mount of Olives. So this is a big hill outside of Jerusalem. And it says, Then Jesus said to them, 
Tonight, all of you will fall away because of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. That's Zechariah 13, 7. Jesus just told these 12 disciples, guys, y'all are about to all fall away. I just don't believe you're going to be there for me. You're not going to make it. In fact, Zechariah 13, one of the minor prophets, he, he even prophesied that this is going to happen. Strike the shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd. He will get struck by the Lord and all the flock. The flock there are the disciples. They're going to be gone, nowhere to be seen, missing in action. Verse 32, Jesus is going to predict his resurrection, and they miss it. They don't even think about that. All they heard was, we're going to fall away. And they can't even think about what was the most important part. And verse 32 is the most important part. He says, after, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. So he's even telling him where he's going to go when he comes back from the dead. This is occurring on Thursday night. Thursday night this is happening. Jesus is going to be on a cross at 9 a.m. Friday morning. Very quickly. Jesus will be dead by 6 p.m. on Friday night, or by 3 p.m., be buried by 6 p.m. And he's already saying, I'm going to be rising from the dead very soon, but you need to be ready because I'm going to Galilee. But look what happens here. This is all Peter can think about. When you hear some shocking news, you can't think about the prophecy. He's focused on the falling away, that what Jesus just said, how he's going he's to abandon the Lord. Peter spoke up and told him, even if everyone falls away because of you, I will never fall away. Even if everyone else, these other low-class disciples might fall away, not me. Jesus, I'll be the one who won't fall away. You're mistaken, Jesus. That's what Peter just said. Truly I tell you, Jesus told in verse 34, tonight, before the rooster crows. That means the rooster will crow early in the morning. Said, this night, you will deny me, Peter, three times. Three times I'm going to get denied by you. And then verse 35, Peter makes this bold statement. Even if I have to die with you, Peter told him, I will never deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. So not Peter here is boldly proclaiming that he's going to be the one who doesn't deny Jesus. These other disciples, they might deny him, but I will not do it. And Peter has this great hope. And here's our principle we, we learn. He has this hope. And w- there's two types of hope for us. We can hope for something. And a lot of us hope for something. We might hope for something to happen in an election. We hope that gas prices will come down. We hope that food becomes affordable. We hope inflation ends. We might hope the Cincinnati Reds win their baseball game. We hope UK Wildcats are going to get some great players in the portal, the transfer portal. We hope that we're going to have a, just a wonderful worship service each Sunday. We hope all our friends will be here when we come to church. That's what hope is. It's hoping for something. And that's what Peter had. Peter had this hope that he's making, he's comparing himself to the wrong person. He's making a comparison to his friends, the other disciples. And he's saying, they might fall away, but I'm just a cut above them. Everyone wants to be better than someone else. You look at your fellow co-workers and everyone's secretly thinking, I'm smarter and I'm better than everybody else in the room. That's what people think. That's what Peter's thinking. He's thinking, I'm the best guy here. And then there's another type of hope. And this is the type of hope that we as believers have to have. It's not the hope for something. It's the hope in someone. And that's what Peter needed to have. And that in someone is Jesus. He was not trusting Jesus' words. Jesus said, all of you are going to fall away. You're going to abandon me. And Peter did not believe him. So that's what we see here. And they all said the same thing. Flip down now. You're, these are our last uh, verses we're going to read. Look at starting in verse 69. You're in Matthew chapter 26, verse 69. 
This is very sad, what we're about to read. This is Peter. This is the man who's never going to deny Jesus. At, at, right after this, um, Jesus is then arrested. He has the, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He has a, a time of prayer. The Bible says he was so intense in his prayer life that his, his sweat was becoming drops of blood. And then all of a sudden, Judas shows up with his chief priests in the middle of the night. They're carrying torches and swords. And Jesus is arrested. Peter, the Bible says, pulled out his sword. And it, 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 in Matthew's account, it does not identify it was Peter. But in John's account, in John 18.10, it does identify Peter. He pulls out his sword, and one of the arresting officers was named Malchus. Peter, a bold man, he swung his sword. Apparently, Malchus ducked, and, you know, in a awfully close call, and he cut off his ear. Well, then Jesus realizes this isn't good, because that really could have got Peter in trouble, cutting off the ear of someone. So Jesus had to pull a quick miracle real quick, picks up the ear, puts it back on Malchus's head. What I, We can never forget when that story happens. And in fact, uh, you can see this here in verse, uh, verse 51. I'm in Matthew 26, 51. It says, um, At that moment, one of those with Jesus reached out his hand and drew his sword. This is Peter. He struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. Jesus told him, Put your sword back in its place because all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Do you know that principle is true? If you go around killing, some, you go around killing people, you'll get killed. Somebody will shoot you. And if you go around pulling out guns, somebody's going to pull out a gun and shoot you. And uh, Jesus, in John's account, it says, in John chapter 18, it says he healed him right there. I always think Malchus, the man who got healed while they were arresting Jesus, of all the people who realized maybe this guy is the Son of God, I just lost my ear and he put it back on. So he performed that miracle right there even at his arrest. So he gets arrested. Jesus it also saves Peter because he would have really gotten in trouble cutting off the high priest's servant's ear. He would also got arrested, but Jesus was able to, to heal him and they moved along. Jesus goes in front of the Sanhedrin and while he's on trial, this is the Jewish ruling council. Remember, Peter is very Jewish. He admired the Sanhedrin. Peter probably thought Jesus was ushering in some type of political kingdom. He was going to go sit on the throne of David there in Jerusalem. So that's where we're going to pick up right now. Jesus is on trial, and Peter's kind of lingering along. So what it would be like is say Jesus is up here facing the Sanhedrin. He's uh, getting questioned. He's in his chains. He's getting beat. Out in the lobby, kind of far away, or even outside a little bit, but he could still peep through the window. Peter's kind of, he's lingering around. He didn't leave. He's aware of where Jesus is at. He's not right there next to him, but he's around the situation. So that's where we pick up. Verse 69. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl approached him and said, you are with Jesus, the Galilean, too. So somebody recognized Peter. This was at night, but he apparently was noticeable. But he denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea. He's just lying. That's what lying is. I have no, no clue. I don't know. It's like when a police officer goes, or if you, I'm sure I, in Georgia, I had some several, we had a lot of police officers that attend our church. They said it was almost comical. You would go, when people get in trouble, no one seems to know anything. It's like a miracle. You show up to arrest people. It's people dealing drugs at this house over here. You walk up. Sir, do you know the man? I have no idea. Sir, do you, or did you realize he was dealing cocaine? Well, I have no clue. What are you talking about? He has drugs on him? Every single person at that point, when it's time to get arrested and question the police, no one knows anything. They don't even know their name. They don't have any ID. That they're just totally clueless on earth. That's kind of what Peter's doing right here. He doesn't know who Jesus is. You just act dumb. He's playing dumb. He's lying. That's what this is. 
I don't know what you're talking about. When he had gone into the gateway, so basically he moved locations, he got away from the servant girl. When he had gone into the gateway, another woman saw him and told those who were with him, this man was with Jesus, the Nazarene. They're trying, you know, Jesus is getting questioned here, and they're start saying, who are this guy's followers? Well, lo and behold, there's one named Peter. And look what Peter says. They're identi- trying to identify him. And again, he denied it with an oath. So now he's going to take an oath. Remember, Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 5, do not take an oath. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. So now Jesus, now Peter's going to start taking an oath how much he, did, he hates. He, I don't even know who this guy is. He says, I don't know the man. I mean, he's, he's ready to sign the paperwork that he doesn't know the man. He's wanting a sworn statement. He does not know this man. After a little while, those standing there approached him and said to Peter, you really are one of them, since even your accent gives you away. It's like being from Alabama. You can't hide it. Said Peter, I know who you are. You speak like a Galilean. You don't belong around here. You are different. You dress different. You talk different. We know you're the one. That's what I mean. They are, you see, it's the walls are closing in on Peter. And he is getting worried because poor Jesus, he's up here just getting beat by the Sanhedrin. They're spitting in his face. They're giving him a hard time. Peter's out there just lying through his teeth fast as he can. He's sw- now he's swearing. He's signing oaths. He doesn't even know the man. He wants a sworn statement. Put it, in, put it in a pen. Now look at verse 74. Jesus, or Peter, takes it to a new level. We're going to go beyond an earth. We're going to start bringing down curses. Now we're cussing. We're going to cuss Jesus out, out there. We're using the Lord's name in vain. It says here, verse 74, then he started to curse and to swear with an oath. The Bible tells us in the third commandment, you do not, thou shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Peter is doing that. He is swearing. He's cursing. He says, I don't know. And there's probably some other words that were used that aren't listed right here because they're cuss words. I don't know the man. And then he probably say, said some statements that are totally inappropriate to the, that girl. Those that are standing around him. And it says in verse 74, immediately a rooster crowed. Immediately. Just right then. He's cussing Jesus out right there. And do you know, in Luke's account, it says at that very moment, after Peter cussed him out, swore an oath against him, talked about how bad Jesus was, I don't know who, have any idea who that man is, it says their eyes met. So Jesus was probably being paraded by, and he looked up, and he looked, and his eyes locked with Jesus' eyes. That's what Luke's account says. They met each other, probably from a distance. A good distance. The rooster just crowed. Their eyes met. And what happens here? Immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words that Jesus has spoken. Wrote Those words came back over in verse 34. Truly I tell you, Jesus told him, Tonight, before the rooster crows, you will deny me. Three times. Three times you're going to deny me. And it says, in the very last sentence of verse 75, and he went outside and wept bitterly. Do you know, that's the last, when their eyes met, Jesus and Peter. Do you know the next time they see each other? Peter's fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And there's a man standing cooking fish. And Peter realizes it's the Lord. And he jumps out of the boat with all his clothes on. Just swims, you know, doesn't put a swimsuit on. He just cloaks and everything. Just plops out of the boat and swims to shore. You know, of course, Peter does that every time with Jesus. They never, they never catch anything, it seems. So, but Jesus already had fish. That's the, the next time they meet, after their eyes meet, that was the last time he saw Christ before the crucifixion. Their eyes meet. 
He goes out and weeps bitterly. Peter's nowhere to be found during the crucifixion and even until after the resurrection. And, they, and, and what we see here is Peter, I think the story that we see in this man, if you go back to verse 33, Matthew 26, 33, this is, Peter did something wrong. Jesus told them that all of them are going to fall away because of him. And Peter had this arrogant, cocky attitude. He was better than the other disciples. This is what a danger of pride. And I want to tell you, even for us on Sunday night, we have to guard ourselves. Here we are. I look out at our crowd. You are, this is the Sunday morning, Sunday school. Now, some of you even come to two services on Sunday morning. Sunday night and Wednesday night crowd. And it's easy for all of us that are so faithful here to church, who are always in church, to look at those people that come, they're lucky if they come once every three Sundays, if they can make it, and they're proud of themselves for making it for one every three Sundays. And it's easy to have some type of attitude. So, well, I'm glad you made it this, this Sunday. Well, I guess we'll see you in May. So it, it just this attitude, that's kind of what Peter has right here. Look at verse 33. Peter told Jesus, even if everyone else, all these folks fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And it was Peter the one who's using foul language and cussing. I want you to know, next time you say a cuss word, I want you to think of Peter. Because Peter cussed Jesus out. He stood right out there in the outside on the third time. It says he, he brought down curses and he used he swore with an oath. He was so angry. He was so embarrassed of being identified with Jesus. And the rooster crows and their eyes lock. And the biblical principle for us this evening, we look at Peter and we are reminded that we also want to be faithful. And just if the Lord tells us what to do, if he tells us we're going to have the keys of the kingdom, if we're going to have the confession that we're going to be fall away, we have to trust the Lord. Because if it can happen to Peter, folks, it can happen to us. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, I pray that you strengthen all of us this evening. Lord, we thank you for this passage on Peter. Lord, I know many of us here identify with Peter because we feel very strong and, and firm in our own personal faith. And Lord, Peter was someone who understood what it meant to confess you as, your, as, your, as the Messiah. Yet, Lord, also he fell. Lord, he denied you three times. And you were right. And he wept bitterly. He went back to his old life. Jesus, I pray this invitation. Lord, there might be someone here tonight who needs to get saved. Lord, I pray they walk this aisle. They don't need to be ashamed or bashful. Lord, you've told us that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And Lord, we give you this invitation. We give you this worship service that we will respond to you just like Peter did. Lord, I just pray as we uh, move into this time of response that we're bold in what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Gene King's going to lead us along with Betty our, our hymn of invitation. What's our song tonight? I surrender all. I surrender all. Let's stand together. I wait down front. If you want to make a decision tonight, if you want to get saved, you walk this aisle and come take my hand. Oh, to Jesus I surrender.
ready? Thank you so much, Gene. I want to remind you, the next time we will gather here at church will be Wednesday night. We have dinner at 5.30, and everyone needs to come eat dinner. It's a wonderful dinner. Darlene, what are we cooking this Wednesday night? Chicken spaghetti. Chicken spaghetti. And then I am starting a new Bible study on all the different denominations, and we are studying the difference this week between Southern Baptist, Independent Baptist, Free Will Baptist, and our primitive Baptist friends, what we might call Reformed Baptist. So we're going to look at what does it mean to be a, we're a Southern Baptist church. How does that compare to all of our other friends? So you need to bring your Bible, and we'll have a wonderful time studying God's Word. And that meets at 6.30 in the downstairs fellowship hall. So that's the next time we gather. Remember, next Sunday night at 6 o'clock when we have service, Buddy Lyles is going to be here doing our concert next week. So, all right, Gene. All right, let's, let's join in singing. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I really am. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by. 